Hi, this is Andy Teach, host of Andy's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to Florence, Italy. We're here in Florence, which is where the Renaissance began, and it ran from about 1300 to 1700, and in fact, Renaissance means rebirth. And what happened is Renaissance was basically an extension of the Middle Ages, and it was before the Age of Enlightenment. So during the Renaissance, there was a focus on humanism, where man was the center of all things. And as a result of that, there were great strides in things like science, art, architecture, politics, and literature. And one of the most famous people from Florence was Michelangelo, or as they say in Florence, Michelangelo. And he's still only known by one name, uh, just like Elvis, Madonna, and Prince. And Michelangelo is his first name. You know his full name. It is Michelangelo de Lodovico Buonarate Simone. So that's Michelangelo de Lodovico Buonarate Simone. That is his full name. I bet you didn't know that. So when you first arrive here and see this immense building and complex, this is the Florence Cathedral known as the Duomo. And two things you notice right away. One is how big it is. It is humongous. As you can see, uh, that's the cathedral. To the right is the, uh, the bell tower. There's a baptistry. Uh, there's a museum. And, it, it, and it's also uh, Brunelleschi's dome, the famous dome which we climbed up earlier today. Uh, another thing you will notice is just how intricate and detailed all of the work on the outside is. Uh, whether it be mosaics, uh, some of the stonework. It's just amazing what they did during the Renaissance in terms of creative creativity. How long did it take to build this complex? And it's about 150 years, from 1296 to 1436. Anyway, uh, Florence is beautiful. If you're an art fan, architecture fan, this is the place to be. The Cathedral of Florence, officially known as Cattedrale Santa Maria del Fiore, but better known as the Duomo, was originally planned in 1296 as the Gothic Cathedral by Anafo di Cambio. It replaced the Church of Santa Riparata, a cathedral church with a history going back to the early Middle Ages, the remnants of which we will see later in the crypt. In the 13th century, many Italian cities were getting rich because of trade on the Silk Road. To demonstrate their wealth, many of these cities built large cathedrals. Most of this cathedral was built at the beginning of the Renaissance. By the end of the 15th century, the cathedral had a Renaissance dome sitting on top of a Tuscan Gothic structure with Gothic Renaissance side doors but still no facade. The Medici realized that Giotto's original plans for the facade were too Gothic to match the Renaissance style roof, so they opened up a new competition to design the facade. Because many different people were in charge of the project over the next century, the style continually changed. Francesco Talenti, who led the construction of the cathedral from 1351 on, increased its size even more by extending the nave. The central nave was built in 1378, and the aisles were built in 1380. Construction of the church would last until 1436, when it was consecrated by Pope Eugene IV. The originally planned Gothic front facade, however, was unrealized. It was originally designed by Onalfo in Romanesque style, and then in Gothic style by Talenti. The stunning marble cladding that we see today was only added much later, from 1876 to 1887, in a neo-Gothic style, with colorful patterns by Emilio de Fabrice. As a result, the facade nicely complements the cathedral's 14th century bell tower design. Let's take a closer look at the beautiful and intricate facade. Above the rose window, there are busts of great Florentine artists. Here we see the Twelve Apostles with the Madonna and Child in the middle. The three huge bronze doors date from 1899 to 1903. They were adorned with scenes from the life of the Madonna. The main portal or door was by Augusto Pasalia.
mosaics and the lunettes above the doors were designed by Niccolo Barabino. They represent from left to right charity among the founders of Florentine philanthropic institutions, Christ enthroned with Mary and John the Baptist, and Mary surrounded by Florentine artisans, merchants, and humanists paying homage to the faith. This is the entrance to the dome of Coppola. This is the Porta della Mandorla, or Door of the Almond, on the north side of the cathedral. <laughs> it's called that because of the almond-shaped aureole in which the Virgin ascends to heaven above the door. The mosaic of the Annunciation in the Lunette by David Gerlandio and his brother Domenico was made from 1489 to 1490 and shows the announcement by the angel Gabriel to Mary that she would give birth to a son. So this is the Giotto Bell Tower. It was designed by Giotto di Bandone. And it was originally designed in 1334. And at the time, he was the official master builder of the city. And he died in 1337. So the bell tower was completed first by Andrea Pisano and later by Francesco Talente. And it's over 250 feet tall. And it was finally completed in 1359. Beautiful bell tower. So the facade is made with green, pink, and white Tuscan marble. Beautiful marble. And what they call the relief decorations were created by Pisano. So it was a team effort that built this, but it's called Giotto's Bell Tower. And you can hear the bells ring, I believe, every hour. Actually, the bells are rung at various times, including at 11.30 a.m., the only ones in Florence that are rung at this time. Brunelleschi initiated the signal for the workers on the dome. It is said that if the quick-set mortar being mixed at ground level and raised to the construction zone was mixed just prior to the lunch break, the workers were returned from their break to find the concrete set and therefore wasted. The 11.30 a.m. bell told the workers to stop preparing the mortar. Let's take a closer look at the tower. Each of the four sides features a continuation of the other sides. Andrea Pisano and members of his school carried Giotto's design up to the first two levels, while artists such as Alberto Arnaldi adorned the outside with carved lozenges. The decorative hexagonal panels and lozenges display the concept of universal order and tell the story of the redemption of mankind. The reliefs begin with the creation of man inspired by Genesis on the lower level in the hexagonal panels and continue with the lozenges with their blue majolica background, with a depiction of his activities, the planets which regulate the course of his existence, the virtues which fortify him, the liberal arts which educate him, and the sacraments which sanctify him. On the next level on each side, there were four Gothic statues and niches. They were sculpted in the 1300s and 1400s by different artists and represent various prophets and patriarchs, including David, Solomon, Moses, and Abraham. Over time, these panels and sculptures have been substituted by copies, but the originals are on view in the museum, which we will see later in the video. The three top levels of the tower were built by Francesco Talenti, master of the works from 1348 to 1359. Each level is larger than the lower one, but the perspective was designed so that when seen from below, each level looks exactly equal in size. Instead of a spire, Talenti built a large terrace at the top. We went inside the tower, but decided not to climb up the 414 steps because we had just climbed up the 436 steps of the Brunelleschi Dome. However, by not climbing up to the top of Giotto's tower, we missed a fantastic close-up view of the dome. The Florence Cathedral Dome by Filippo Brunelleschi was built from 1420 to 1434 and was consecrated in 1436. It is 376 feet tall, and the lantern on top of the dome, which was added in 1461 by Michelozzi Michelozzo, is 66 feet high. 
On top of the lantern rests the bronze ball built by Andrea del Verrocchio in 1472. To position the ball, they used machines invented by Brunelleschi. A young Leonardo da Vinci was among the apprentices that helped in this difficult operation. In other words, he was an unpaid intern. A part of the dome remained unfinished when Brunelleschi died, the upper part of the drum. The competition to build this section was won by the Italian woodcarver, sculptor, and architect Baccio Dognolo. Construction of the drum began, but according to tradition, Baccio decided at some point to seek the opinion of Michelangelo, who was in town at the time. Looking at the work, Michelangelo exclaimed, It looks like a cricket cage. Offended, Baccio left the drum unfinished, just as we see it today. Brunelleschi, a goldsmith by trade, won a public competition and submitted his plans after he went to Rome to study the Pantheon, which had featured the world's largest dome. He was forced to work with his rival, Lorenzo Ghiberti, a fellow goldsmith. The dome is a major engineering feat and was ahead of its time because no reinforcement was used. No scaffolding was utilized as the dome supported itself as it was built. A double frame or shell with hollow space in between was used and the stairs were placed between the two shells. The outer, much smaller shell supports the roof and protects the inner shell from the elements. Brunelleschi placed herringbone brickwork, little known before his time, into the texture of the cupola. Brunelleschi also invented a three-speed hoist with an intricate system of gears, pulleys, screws and drive shafts powered by a single yoke of oxen turning a wooden tiller and a 65-foot-tall crane with a series of counterweights and hand screws to move loads laterally once they've been raised to the right height. So this is known as the Baptistry, and it's one of Florence's oldest buildings. It actually is older than the cathedral, and it's constructed on top of Roman foundations, possibly as early as the 6th century, so it's pretty old. The octagon had been a common shape for baptisteries for many centuries since early Christian times. The number eight is a symbol of regeneration in Christianity, signifying the six days of creation, the day of rest, and a day of recreation through the sacrament of baptism. The inside dates to about the 13th century, and there's mosaics on the ceiling, uh, which depict stories from the Bible, and we're gonna take a look at that in a few minutes. The exterior is white and green marble, which is beautiful. Let's get a close-up of that. So after the interior was done, uh, something called the Guild of the Wool Merchants, they funded a renovation. And originally they were wooden doors, but they replaced it with these new bronze doors back in the 14th century. And these doors are very famous. And we're gonna close up in a minute. It's called the Gates of Paradise. So the south doors were created in 1336 by Pisano, who also did part of the bell tower. And in 1403, a design by Lorenzo Ghiberti uh, was selected. They actually picked him in a contest over Brunelleschi for the design of the door. However, the panel submitted by Ghiberti's main rival Brunelleschi is now considered the first Renaissance artwork as it departed from the prevailing Byzantine art style by using perspective and showing realistic depictions of humans in their environment. Let's get a close up of the door. Alright, this is a better view. So each of these panels depicts a biblical scene. And I'm going to get a little closer. There's 10 of them total. So all the panels were done by 1452. And these are not the original panels. They finally put in replicas. But the originals, I believe, are inside the cathedral somewhere. We'll do one by one. Here are the 10 panels in detail, starting in the upper left going down. The creation of Adam and Eve in original sin and the expulsion from the paradise of earth. The story of Noah with the ark, in the foreground his shame, drunkenness, and on the right his sacrifice. Isaac, on the roof is Rebecca hearing God's warning about the eventual conflict between her two unborn sons. Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. David in the process of severing the head of Goliath. 
now the upper right going down. Cain and Abel, the brothers offer their sacrifices, Cain slays Abel. Abraham, the angels announce that Sarah will have a son. Joseph, being sold by his brothers. The conquest of Jericho, Joshua on a chariot preceded by the Ark of the Covenant. Solomon, receiving the Queen of Sheba. While the exterior is definitely interesting to look at, especially due to the intricate bronze doors, its interior is really worth a visit, especially to see the mosaics on the inside of the cupola. Work began on the mosaic decoration of the interior in the 13th century and it took 60 to 70 years to complete. The mosaics were by Jacopo Toriti, possibly with the assistance of several members of the New Florentine School of Painting. The mosaics are dominated by the huge figure of Christ in judgment, with scenes from the Last Judgment occupying three of the dome's eight segments. On his left are images of salvation, which were meant to comfort good citizens, while on the right, damnation and hell, which was supposed to scare the crap out of them. The horizontal layers tell the stories of St. John the Baptist, the patron saint of Florence, of Jesus, of Joseph, and of the creation of the world. The angelic hosts occupy the highest point of all, in the center of the dome. These are the eastern panels from bottom to top. A partial view of the story of John, the life of Christ, presentation in the temple, Joseph's dream, and his flight into Egypt. The story of Joseph, his sale and his time in prison. The creation, the hardships of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel's offerings, and Cain killing Abel, and the angels. These are the northwest panels from bottom to top. The damned in hell where the devil is eating newly arrived souls. John the Baptist and the apostles as witnesses to the last judgment. Angels with the instruments of torture and with trumpets, and choirs of angels. Besides the spectacular ceiling, there are some other highlights in the interior as well. I'm not sure, but I think in the movie Inferno with Tom Hanks, this is where the death mask of Dante was hidden. The tomb of anti-pope Giovanni XXIII, born Baldassare Cosa, can be found in the Florence Baptistry. He was called the anti-pope because he opposed Pope Gregory XII, whom the Catholic Church now recognizes as the rightful successor to St. Peter. He was eventually deposed and tried for various crimes. Cosa died in Florence in 1419, and although he was not well liked in his time, he was a friend of the powerful Medici family who had him buried in this holy building. It was thanks to Cosa that the Medici managed to become so wealthy. Upon becoming pope, Cosa, out of loyalty to Giovanni de' Medici, who had helped him on many occasions, took on the Medici Bank to manage the Vatican's finances, which played a large part in helping them amass a fortune. Although he was stripped of his popehood, Cosa wanted to be buried in the Florence Baptistry. Cosimo de' Medici commissioned this funeral monument from Donatello and Michelozzo between 1422 and 1428 for his notorious friend. Intarso is a type of inlaid marble work where different colored pieces of stone are joined together so closely that the finished product seems like one singular piece. Intarso can be done to form images or simply geometric or floral patterns. Yeah. 
Based on the intricate exterior, I was expecting a cathedral filled with numerous paintings, mosaics, and sculptures like St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, but actually, the cathedral's gothic interior is less colorful and decorations were kept to a minimum. The exception is the fresco in the dome's interior, painted between 1572 and 1579 by Giorgio Vasari and his assistants. The fresco depicts scenes from The Last Judgment. The restoration of these ceiling frescoes began in 1978 and was completed in 1994. Also of note is the marble floor with intricate patterns, which is attributed to Baccio Daniello, who also worked on the drum of the dome. After his death, one of his sons continued his work. The clock is the work of Lorenzo di Benvenuto della Vopaia and his heads of prophets, or perhaps the four evangelists in the corners, painted by Paolo Uccello in 1443, who also painted the blue background and the gold hands. Time has its point of reference on the clock as the sunset, the time when Ave Maria is sung. The clock is wound every eight or nine days. The windows are from cartoons by famous artists of the early Renaissance period. Ghiberti, Paolo Uccello, Donatello, and Andrea del Castano. The Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, or Museum of the Works of the Cathedral, opened in 1891. The museum has over 750 works covering 720 years of history, with 25 rooms on three floors. This is the Saloni del Paradiso, Hall of Paradise, which contains original Duomo facade sculptures on a reconstructed facade. It also features the original baptistry doors, including the Gates of Paradise.
The Galleria del Campanile, or Room of Giotto's Bell Tower, features original reliefs and statues from the famous bell tower. Here we see 16 original statues and 54 reliefs, which are shown in their original order. The Sala del Cantori, a room of the choirs, features two choir lofts from the Duomo from the 1430s. The deposition, Michelangelo's Pieta, was intended for his own tomb. It is an unfinished work which he made from 1546 to 1555 and it once stood in the Duomo. The hooded figure of Nicodemus is also interpreted as a self-portrait. Michelangelo abandoned it because of the flaws in the marble. The damage to Christ's left leg and arm is believed to have been inflicted by Michelangelo himself in frustration at his failing skills. The Galleria della Coppola focuses on Brunelleschi's dome. I see dead people. The Galleria dei Modelli features seven wooden models submitted for the new facade, which was going to replace the medieval facade that was demolished in 1587. Here is one of the models. Here are some of the other highlights of the museum. There is a secret that lies a few feet beneath the Duomo, the Santa Reparata Crypt, where a major archaeological dig beneath the cathedral from 1965 to 1973 brought to light the remains of the old basilica of Santa Reparata, strong evidence of early Christianity in Florence. The first building dates back to about 780 AD, and the mosaics date back to the 8th century. The second transformation occurred during the late 9th century, while the third and final transformation occurred in the 13th century. Subsequent maintenance kept Santa Reparata going until 1379, when a decision was reached to demolish the basilica completely in order to make way for the new cathedral. The basilica's foundation is said to be the result of a vow and thanks for the Christian victory over the king of the Goths around 405 AD.
Here are the remains of Santa Reparata. Saint Reparata was a third century virgin martyr. She was arrested for her faith and was tortured. Her persecutors tried to burn her alive, but she was saved by a shower of rain. She was then compelled to drink boiling tar. When she again refused to renounce her beliefs, she was decapitated. Her legend states that immediately upon dying, a dove appeared to symbolize the departure of her spirit to heaven. Later elaborations of her legend state that her body was laid in a boat and blown by the breath of angels to a bay in Nice. Well, that's the end of the tour. There's a lot to see, but I highly recommend spending a day here, seeing the great architecture, and learning and experiencing the history behind this amazing complex. After climbing 436 steps at the Brunelleschi Dome, this is Annie Teach, host of Annie's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to Florence, Italy. This is the entrance to the dome, or cupola. So we are now waiting online to climb to the top of Brunelleschi's dome. Uh, the okay. dome was built in the Renaissance uh, period by Filippo like Brunelleschi. There were 436 steps, which is a lot of steps. And we're probably going to have sore legs and heart attack symptoms. However, when we get to the top, we're going to have a great view of Florence. So when you buy tickets to the Duomo, uh, you basically get a ticket that covers five different areas of museums. And that includes a ticket to go to the top of the dome. However, you have to pick a specific time. And it's every 15 minutes that they allow 100 people to go up to the top of the dome. So even if you're not planning on going to the top of the dome, you might as well pick a time because when you get here, you might change your mind or vice versa. You might be excited and then when you take a look at what's inside, you may. <laughs> Wanted to change your mind and not go up to the top. We're excited about getting to the top of the dome, hopefully. Uh, we'll let you know what happens. But again, uh, Brunelleschi's Dome, or Coppola as it's called here. And it's uh, actually when it was built, it was the largest dome in the world. And it's still one of the largest domes today. So it's a beautiful thing. And we'll be going up in about 20 minutes. All right, we are starting one, two, instead of Mississippi, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, one Brunelleschi, two Brunelleschi, three Brunelleschi. Okay. All right, I've done 10 steps. I'm tired already. <sighs> All right, so the passageway isn't too bad. There's room. We stretch before we started. All right, these are not gentlemen who can make it to the top. These are actually statues of bishops. And we're not even halfway to the top, but we're making progress. So now we're at the portion where the stairs are winding and much more narrow. You can see them. Going in little circles here. And we have 436 stairs to go total. We think we're at around 150. I'm getting dizzy, but no big deal. Hope these end soon. All right, we're getting near the top. This is the inside of the cathedral. Okay. Making progress. Are we near the top? Let's hope so. Oh, there's something up here. Oh. Okay. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I think we're trapped. Well, I have some granola bars and a bottle of water. That should hold us. Okay. Oh, jeez. It's flat here. I love it. Ooh, nice. Well, we'll be up there soon. 
you'll see some magnificent views. I guess we're going up here. Oh boy. Oh man. That looks a little difficult. Hold the, hold the railing. One Mississippi, one Brunelleschi, two Brunelleschi, three Brunelleschi, 300 Brunelleschi. Oh no, more stairs. How many you count so far? All right, we have about 100 to go. They really need to add some more stairs in here. <laughs> This is a two-way highway that can only fit one lane. How was it up there? Yes. Good, yeah? Thumbs up, all right, good. I guess we, oh, oh, wow. Up there? Yeah. <laughs> it's worth it. It's, it's worth it, okay. Oh my God. Now we get to the steep part, wow. Oh geez. Ugh. I'm gonna put this camera away. Uh, we're this close to daylight. And I want to show you how steep these stairs are here. That was the hardest part right there. Coming up. Is there a defibrillator here? Alright, the final stairs to the top. Oh, Alright. Four hundred thirty-two Brunelleschi, four hundred thirty-three Brunelleschi, four thirty-four Brunelleschi. Daylight. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I was in better shape twenty years ago when I was here. But it is worth it for this view. And I'm not good with heights either, but you gotta make an exception sometime. All right, I see another dome here. I hope we didn't climb the wrong dome. Beautiful. Incredible views from the top of the Brunelleschi Dome at the Florence Cathedral, the Duomo. And that is the Jewish synagogue. That, I believe, is the Santa Croce church where Michelangelo and Galileo are buried. Come look here. Good job. Where are you guys coming from? <laughs> Los Angeles. Oh, that's where we are. That's where we are. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. I have a Canon camera. You have this? Oh, oh my. That's a pink one. Oh, pink one. Hey, there you go. Do you, like, you guys like heights? Are you okay with heights? Does it bother you? Not scary? Because I'm scared. Uh, I can't get over there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you call and show you something? No, I can't go. Show something. He's worse than me. The descent down. This is the harder part. Okay. All right, only 400 steps to go. I think the people were vertically challenged back then. Hold on to the railing. This is the steepest part, actually. Oh, 
just bang my head. I think I have a concussion. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> okay. Now we have the little windy stairs. Uh, traffic jam. All right, we got people going up and down on a very, very narrow staircase. On journal. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This walkway is tighter than my butt. <laughs> I'm so soft, Mark. Yeah. No. The elevator is much quicker. That was a uh, Brunelleschi dome joke that no one got. Much better going down. Okay, this is the narrow staircase portion. Is there no handrail here? No. Oh, great. Any torture devices here? Is this it? Two steps. One step. Oh no, two more steps. Yes! We have made it to the end. Mission accomplished. And there's no line. Unless they're down there somewhere. Ah! There's the bell tower. Nice. Ustedes ahora podrán bajar a otra terraza. Aquí hay un baño abajo. This is the Ponte Vecchio, which means old bridge, which is a medieval bridge. And it's one of the few remaining bridges with houses built upon it. It dates back to 1345. And it was uh, basically built to replace a bridge which had been destroyed by a flood. Houses being built on bridges is pretty common in Europe back then, especially during the Middle Ages. But this is the only bridge in Florence that has survived World War II. So the houses were initially used as workshops, and there were a lot of like diverse shopkeepers. There were butchers, tanners, that kind of thing. But in 1593, Duke Ferdinand I decided to replace them with goldsmiths, reportedly because the shops produced too much garbage and it caused a foul stench. Today it's mostly jewelry that they're selling. And obviously it's quite crowded today and every day, but it's definitely a place to go. Beautiful views of the Arno River from the bridge itself, and then uh, across the bridge, there's some walkways. And who do we have here? Cellini. So we see all the locks here, which usually means love.
The Uffizi Gallery is one of the most famous and popular museums in the world. Its collection of Renaissance paintings, housed in a 16th century palace, contains works by the most famous artists of the era, including Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Botticelli, and Raphael. The Palazzo degli Uffizi, or Uffizi Palace, was built between 1560 and 1580 to house the administration of the government of Grand Duke Cosimo I de Medici. The building was designed by the Duke's favorite architect, Giorgio Vasari, who created the U-shaped building with two long galleries, connected by a short arcaded gallery which opens up towards the Arno River. In 1565, even before the Uffizi was completed, Vasari connected the building with the adjacent Palazzo Vecchio and with the Palazzo Pitti across the river, so that the Medici rulers would not have to go outside when walking from one building to another. The Uffizi Gallery contains the world's largest collection of Renaissance art, largely collected by members of the Medici family during the 16th and 17th centuries. Francesco I de Medici, successor of Cosimo I, decided to use the upper floor of the Uffizi, which featured unusually large windows, to display the family's collection of artwork, thus creating the world's oldest art gallery. His successors kept expanding the collection until 1737, when Anna Maria Luisa de' Medici, the last heiress of the Medici family, donated the works of art to the citizens of Florence. The gallery was officially open to the public in 1765, but prior to that it was open to visitors upon request. In this video you will see and hear the history behind many of the major pieces of art and learn the names of the artists behind these stunning works. You can't help but admire these artists for their beautiful, intricate, detailed, and time-consuming masterpieces. They were among the most skilled artists the world has ever known. We start out seeing some of the more well-known 13th and 14th century altarpieces, which were originally displayed in various cathedrals and churches. The Maista of Santa Trinita by Cimabue was originally meant to stand on the main altar of the Church of Santa Trinita. Eight angels surround the Madonna with child. In the middle at the bottom are Abraham and David, from whose offspring the Savior would rise. On the bottom left and right, Jeremiah and Isaiah look upwards to confirm the prophecies inscribed on the scrolls concerning the virginal birth of Jesus. This altarpiece has been in the Uffizi Gallery for a hundred years. The Ognisante Madonna by Giotto di Bandoni was originally painted for the Church of Ognisante. This work is an homage to the virginity, maternity, and royalty of Mary. Giotto was also the main builder of the Giotto Bell Tower, which is part of the Florence Duomo. The Maista by Duccio di Bonasegna is the first known work of the Sienese painter and shows the Madonna enthroned between six kneeling angels with 30 medallions showing saints and biblical figures. The painting was restored in 1989. The Body Apolyptic by Giotto shows a Madonna with child, flanked by St. John the Evangelist and St. Nicholas on the left, and St. Peter and St. Benedict on the right. A Apolyptic is a painting divided into several sections. The painting has been in the Uffizi Gallery since 1957 and was restored in 2009. The Presentation of the Virgin in the Temple by Ambrosio Lorenzetti was originally painted for the Siena Cathedral and shows saints in a more attractive form than typical altarpieces of the time. The use of lacquer and expensive lapis lazuli for the blue tones confirms the importance of the work. Annunciation by Simone Martini and Lippo Memmi was also painted originally for the Siena Cathedral and was brought to the Uffizi by the Grand Duke Ferdinand III. Interestingly, the artists were brothers-in-law. On either side of the Annunciation are Saint Ansano and Saint Judith. In the medallions above are various prophets carrying scrolls, which represent the Incarnation. Typical of Sienese art, the work features much gold in realistic detail. Altarpiece of the Blessed Humility by Pietro Lorenzetti was originally painted for the Church of St. John Evangelist in Florence where it was dismantled into several pieces and was reassembled in 1954 based on an 18th century drawing. The work represents 11 scenes from the miraculous life of the Blessed Humility. Pieta by Giottino has been in the Uffizi since 1851. 
This panel painting is considered one of the masterpieces of Florentine painting from the second half of the 14th century because of the rare psychological insight of the faces and for its luminous pictorial quality. Here we see various characters mourning at the deposition of Christ, including a Benedictine nun and a young woman. The Polyptych of San Pancrazio by Bernardo Dadi is a multifaceted altarpiece featuring a central panel showing the traditional Madonna with child and throne with wild angels. To the sides are six panels with saints. Above are 14 panels with prophets, saints, and angels. There are at least six other pieces that are missing. Dadi was most at ease when narrating everyday scenes with graceful figures. The St. Matthew Triptych by Andrea de Cione and Jacopo de Cione has been in the Uffizi since 1899. It was originally commissioned by the Bankers Guild to hang on a pillar in its property. Andrea de Cione became ill during the project, so his brother completed it. The trapezoidal shape is unusual and was created specifically so it can hang on the pillar. We see St. Matthew flanked by four small scenes, Miracle of the Dragons, Calling of the Saint, Resurrection of King Agepus' Son, and Martyrdom of the Saint. The stunning Coronation of the Virgin by Lorenzo Monaco is in a huge gilded and carved frame. The large altarpiece was commissioned for the high altar of a church at a Camaldolese Abbey in Florence and was painted by Don Lorenzo, a monk who lived in the Abbey. The three arches are decorated with vegetable motifs. Over them are three panels containing the paintings. From the left are the Angel of the Annunciation, the Blessed Christ between Cherubims, and the Annunciation. At the side are two piers with twisting columns with paintings of prophets. In the lower part is the predella, with six small paintings of the episodes of the lives of St. Benedict and St. Bernard of Clairvaux. The central painting within the three arcades shows the coronation of the Virgin set in paradise. Christ and the Virgin are seated on a throne, while the sun crowns Mary before angels and numerous saints kneeling at the sides of the painting. These include, dressed in the white robes of the Commodolese order, St. Benedict on the left and St. Romuald on the right, respectively, the founder of Western monasticism and of the Commodolese order. The scene, which is a single one, in spite of the three-part form of the altarpiece, is set above a starry rainbow, the symbolic depiction of the celestial spheres that form the universe according to medieval cosmology. The composition is crowded, but like other Giotto-esque paintings, lacks perspective. The gilded background is typical of Lorenzo's style. The Adoration of the Magi by Lorenzo Monaco and Cosimo Roselli has been in the Uffizi since 1844 and was restored in 1995. Lorenzo Monaco represented the most up-to-date style of the age and was the founder of a stylistic reformation which created lively figures displaying movement in every part of the body. The painting features Christ bestowing blessings and two prophets. Roselli added two more prophets and the two figures of the Annunciation. The Adoration of the Magi by Gentili da Fabriano was commissioned by a rival of the Medici, Paolo Strozzi. Da Fabriano was a tenant of Strozzi's. The abundance of gold publicly represented the affluence of the client. The adoration in the center of the panel is the culminating moment of the procession of the Magi beneath the night sky illuminated by the Star of Bethlehem.
The Coronation of the Virgin by Filippo Lippi was a collaborative effort with four other artists and two carpenters who were all involved in the painting and frame. The work shows the Virgin's arrival in heaven and features St. Ambrose on the far left and St. Eustace in the center. The diptych of the Duke and Duchess of Urbino by Piero della Francesca is considered to be one of the most important works of the Italian Renaissance. This diptych was originally joined by a hinge to be opened like a book. The portraits of Duke Federico da Montefeltro, who was head of a group of mercenaries, and the Duchess Battista Sforza of Urbino shows them facing each other in solemn profiles. The precision of the features, focusing on less attractive features like Federico's nose, which was broken during a tournament, was typical of Flemish art. He also lost his right eye during that tournament, which explains why the left side of his face is painted. It was typical to paint someone from their right side, so in this portrait, it seems that their eyes are locking, implying a bond that transcends death. The background landscape was probably part of the Duke's territory, and is treated with an almost miniaturistic technique. The painting of both of them from high up, a bird's eye view, perhaps from a tower, suggests their power. Tragically, before the artist could finish the portrait, the Duchess had died of acute pneumonia brought on by childbirth. Fortitude by Sandro Botticelli was Botticelli's first notable work and has been in the Uffizi since 1861. This is the first panel of seven virtues but the only one by Botticelli. The virtues were commissioned by the Florentine Merchants Guild to decorate their palazzo. The seven virtues were originally requested from Piero del Poliolo, but he was only able to deliver six of them. Botticelli was working on two of the virtues, but only completed this one. Fortitude is portrayed as a young woman wearing armor over her graceful dress and holding a ruler's scepter. In spite of the military attributes, the virtue alludes to strength and perseverance in the pursuit of good. The seven virtues include the four cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, and the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love charity. Interestingly, the paintings are supported by cypress planks, which are able to resist dampness and the attack of wood-eating insects. Which one? What do you think? The meaning of Primavera by Sandro Botticelli is still the subject of much discussion. In 1498, it was in the house of two of the Medicis and then hung in a Medici villa in the mid-16th century. Vasari described it as, quote, Venus as a symbol of spring being adorned with flowers by the graces, end quote. And in fact, Primavera translates into the word spring. The winged genie on the right is thought to be Zephyrus, who chased and possessed the nymph Chloris and then married her giving her the ability to germinate flowers. Interestingly, the meadow displays almost 200 botanical species of flowers. Next to Chloris is the smiling figure clothed in flowers representing the transformation of Chloris into Flora, the Latin goddess of spring. The woman in the center is possibly Venus, and this is her garden. The three women on the left are derived from ancient images of the three graces. Above is Cupid, the blindfolded god of love. The youth with a hat, sword, and winged sandals is Mercury. Some think the painting shows the celebration of the marriage of one of the Medicis, who is a friend of Botticelli. A more recent interpretation sees the painting as a metaphorical celebration of the liberal arts. The Virgin and Child with Four Angels and Six Saints by Sandro Botticelli features the two figures of the Annunciation, the Virgin and the Angel. The angels on either side of the throne carry the crown of thorns and the nails of the cross, symbols which refer to the Passion of Christ. We also see the Virgin, St. John the Baptist, and the young warrior Michael. On the steps of the throne there is for the first time in history a painted inscription in Italian, which comes from Dante's Divine Comedy. The Birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli is one of the most famous paintings in the world and is based on Greek mythology. Botticelli represented the idea of divine love in the form of a nude Venus. It's been in the Uffizi since 1815 and like Botticelli's Primavera, it once hung in a Medici villa in the mid-16th century. 
However, unlike Primavera, which was painted with brilliant and solid colors, The Birth of Venus was painted with a mixture of diluted yolk and light tempera, which gave it an appearance similar to a fresco. The Birth of Venus title was given in the 19th century, and the fact that this was a rare non-religious nude helped make the painting famous. The Birth of Venus isn't strictly about the Birth of Venus. It depicts the goddess Venus arriving at the shore after her birth, when she had emerged from the sea fully grown. In fact, it was probably inspired by the writings of Homer and Virgil and shows a different episode of the legend of the goddess, her arrival at the island of Kythera or perhaps Cyprus. Venus stands naked on a large shell, being pushed toward shore by a sea swell, helped by the breath of the wind Zephyrus and Aura, who embrace softly while roses fall from the sky. Venus is welcomed by a girl wearing a silken cloth embroidered with daisies and other flowers. This is possibly the Aura of Spring or one of the Three Graces. There are other interpretations of the work, perhaps adding to its legend. The composition, with a central nude figure, and one to the side with an arm raised above the head of the first, and winged beings in attendance, would have reminded its Renaissance viewers of the traditional symbol of the baptism of Christ, marking the start of his ministry on earth. In a similar way, the scene shown here marks the start of Venus's ministry of love. Some art historians think that this could be a wedding painting that suggests appropriate behaviors for brides and grooms. Another explanation is that the painting was executed to flatter Lorenzo de' Medici, the powerful head of the Medici clan. The image of Venus in this picture, and also Primavera, is supposedly modeled on the alleged mistress of both Lorenzo de' Medici and his younger brother. The Madonna of the Pomegranate by Sandro Botticelli shows a pomegranate in Mary's hand, which symbolizes Christ's passion. The large number of seeds refers to the fullness of Christ's suffering. There's a certain lifelessness to the figures in the painting. The Christ child, whose hand is raised in blessing, is lying firmly in Mary's arms, but the sad expression on both of their faces reminds the observer that the Son of God will suffer in the future. The Coronation of the Virgin by Sandro Botticelli was commissioned by the Goldsmiths Guild for a chapel in San Marco in 1488. The painting was new for its time, divided into two zones. The upper part shows the coronation of the Virgin surrounded by dancing angels against a burst of golden rays. The lower part shows the saints John the Evangelist, Augustine, and Jerome, whose writings allude to the scene above. On the extreme right is Saint Eligio, patron saint of blacksmiths. The painting has been in the Uffizi for 200 years and was restored in 1990. Adoration of the Magi by Sandro Botticelli features a scene with numerous characters present, among which are several members of the Medici family. The three Medici portrayed as Magi were all dead at the time the picture was painted. The ancient ruins in the background represent Rome in the ancient pagan world, crumbling down while Christianity rises. This painting is the closest to realism that Botticelli comes. The focus of the scene is within a triangular area formed by the Holy Family and one of the adoring Magi, while all the previous paintings of this subject were all painted in a linear, horizontal composition. While here Botticelli proves to be a technically gifted portrait painter, masterfully depicting the different poses and expressions, in the higher part of the painting we can see some defects in the composition, namely that the Holy Family is much smaller compared to the other protagonists and seem almost detached from the rest. Sandro Botticelli's self-portrait is almost a signature. He's proudly looking out towards the audience on the far right. The painting functioned a little like a business card, a way to show the Medici and the world what he was capable of, and it worked. Botticelli went on to become one of the favorite artists of the Medici. The Tribune was designed by Bernardo Buontalente in 1584. The cupola is encrusted with mother-of-pearl shells set into a background of transparent scarlet lacquer, and for Francesco I, this was the jewel in the gallery's crown. In fact, 6,000 shells from the Indian Ocean were set into the cupola plaster, which is lined with tinfoil gilded with gold leaf, then lacquered in crimson red. Another 2,500 mother-of-pearl shells decorate the drum. The room was restored in 2012, and the velvet wall hangings were restored using the original craftsman's techniques. The windows are made of Venetian glass, which allows the natural light to fall on the paintings, ancient sculptures, and inlaid marble flooring. The tabletop was produced by the Grand Ducal Workshops. 
The Medici Venus statue is a copy from an original 2nd century BC Greek statue. The cabinet of the miniatures contains more than 400 miniatures from the Grand Ducal collection. The room originally had various names and contained antique bronzes, gold objects and classical gems. The oval form was desired by Grand Duke Pietro Leopoldo in 1781. The architect was Zenobi del Rosso and Filippo Lucci painted the fresco on the ceiling. The miniatures on display are small portraits from various eras and schools. They come from a number of collections from Cardinal Leopoldo de' Medici from 1664 to 1675. Some pieces are heirlooms, while others Leopoldo had done by Florence artists. Hung above the miniatures are parchments containing reproductions of paintings by Raphael and Titian, which were once in the Medici collection. The Holy Family with Infant by Michelangelo, also known as the Doni Tondo, was once in the Tribune Room and has been in the Uffizi since 1635 and was restored in 1985. It is still in its original frame. Tondo refers to a round frame and it's the only panel painting by a mature Michelangelo to survive. It is considered by many to be the most important painting of the 16th century. It was painted for the Florentine merchant Agnolo Done and his wife Maddalena Strozzi, possibly for the birth of their daughter Maria. The painting features the Christian Holy Family, the Child Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph, along with St. John the Baptist in the foreground and contains five nude male figures in the background. Mary sits directly on the ground without a cushion between herself and the ground to better communicate the theme of her relationship to the earth. The grass directly below her is green, in sharp contrast to the grassless ground surrounding her. St. Joseph has a higher position in the image compared to Mary, perhaps as head of the family. Mary is located between his legs as if he is protecting her. There is some debate over whether Mary is receiving the Christ child from Joseph or vice versa. Michelangelo based the pose of the nude sitting behind St. Joseph from a sculpture. His other nudes in the painting are also based on classical sculptures. The painting is most likely influenced by the Virgin and Child with St. Anne drawing by none other than Leonardo da Vinci. There is still debate as to the meaning of the composition, but it may be inspired by the biblical passages which refer to the birth and baptism of Christ, hinted at by the bust of the infant St. John to the right and the five round lunettes on the frame showing Christ to angels and prophets. The elaborate Niobe room was restored in 2008 after suffering damage from a bomb blast in 1993. This 18th century room was planned by Pietro Leopoldo, who put the architect Aspari Maria Paolette in charge of displaying a group of 12 classical sculptures. The sculptures were discovered in the 16th century in a Rome vineyard and recall the myth of Niobe, who was destroyed along with her sons by Apollo and Diana, punished for her pride. The statue on the far right is the running Niobean from 150 BC. Triumph by Peter Paul Rubens was inspired by French King Henry IV. The king's widow, Maria de' Medici, commissioned the Flemish artist to paint a commemorative series of battles, sieges, and triumphs. This painting shows Henry IV entering Paris in a manner similar to the way the ancient Romans would enter a city. The Battle, also by Rubens, shows Henry IV in the Battle of Evry. Holy Family with the Infant Saint John by Bronzino relates to the Panciatici Holy Family. This painting was most likely commissioned by Bartolomeo Panciatici, a Florentine academician whose coat of arms can be seen on the fort in the background. It portrays the meeting of the Holy Family with John the Baptist on their return from Egypt, as indicated by the presence of the travel bundle on top of which Jesus is sleeping. Lucrezia Panciatici by Bronzino was also commissioned by her husband, Bartolomeo. This is Eleonora di Toledo with her son Giovanni by Bronzino. Eleonora was the wife of Cosimo I de' Medici, and this is her second son. Her highly valued role as a mother is marked by the pomegranate on her clothing, a symbol of fertility. Her dress with Spanish embroidery is identical to the one found in her tomb in 1857. Raphael lived for four years in Florence from 1504 to 1508. He arrived in the town because he was curious to observe the works of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. 
he became one of the most famous painters of the Italian Renaissance. Madonna of the Goldfinch by Raphael was painted for the merchant Lorenzo Nassi at the time of his marriage in 1505. The panel was damaged in 1547 when the house containing it collapsed. A young Raphael experimented for the first time with a group of figures centered in the foreground. The Virgin Mary is seated with a book in one hand and her son Jesus between her knees. He caresses the goldfinch offered to him by the infant Saint John. The Virgin Mary is dressed in red and blue. Red is a symbol of the Passion of Christ and blue is the symbol of the Church and of Mary. It was one of the more expensive pigments and therefore appropriate to use for an important figure like Mary. The European goldfinch is associated with the crucifixion of Jesus. In this painting, St. John passes the bird on to Jesus as a forewarning of his violent death. The book that Mary is holding is one of the devotional titles given to Mary and means seed of wisdom. It emphasizes that Mary gave birth to Jesus who represents wisdom. When Mary is depicted in the role of the seed of wisdom, she is typically shown seated on a throne with Jesus in her lap. However, in this case, the rock on which Mary sits serves as the throne. Annunciation by Leonardo da Vinci and Andrea del Verrocchio has been in the Uffizi since 1867 and was restored in 2000. It was the first work of da Vinci and it follows the centuries old model with the angel on the left and the virgin on the right with a lectern in between and the scene opening up into a landscape. The kneeling angel looks youthful while the virgin looks surprised while reading and raises her hand in astonishment. Verrocchio used lead based paint and heavy brush strokes and left a note for da Vinci to finish the background in angel. Da Vinci used light brush strokes and no lead. When the Annunciation was x-rayed, Verrocchio's work was evident while Da Vinci's angel was invisible. Adoration of the Magi by Leonardo Da Vinci has been in the Uffizi since 1670 and was restored in 2017. The work was commissioned from Da Vinci by Augustinian monks in 1481 but remained unfinished, although some historians think this is a finished work. There are several narrative episodes at work here, brought together by a kind of continuous motion. The scene filled with people and animals was meant to give the illusion of a figurative metamorphosis from one group to another. The ruins in the background allude to the fall of paganism at the advent of Christ. The Virgin Mary and Child are in the foreground and form a triangular shape with the Magi kneeling in adoration. Behind them is a semicircle of figures, including what may be a self-portrait of da Vinci on the far right. In the background on the left is the ruin of a pagan building which is being repaired by workmen. The ruins are a possible reference to the Basilica of Maxentius, which according to legend, the Romans claim would stand until a virgin gave birth. The palm tree in the center has associations with the Virgin Mary and represents martyrdom, triumph over death. The other tree in the painting is from the Carob family, and the tree and its seeds are associated with crowns, suggesting Christ as the King of Kings. Judith slaying Polyphernes by Artemisia Gentileschi is about Judith, a young Jew and biblical heroine who went to the encampment of the fierce Holofernes, general of the enemy army, dressed in her best clothes and faking a wish to forge an alliance. Struck by her beauty, the Assyrian general invited her to a lavish banquet in his tent. After eating and drinking, Holofernes, now drunk, fell asleep on his bed, allowing Judith to seize her chance to draw her sword and strike the deadly blow. Artemisia Gentileschi portrays the moment that Holofernes is killed by the hand of the determined and powerful Judith. The overall effect is both powerful and frightening. The drunk general is lying on the bed, his head grasped by his hair, and the sword plunged into his neck. Furthermore, Artemisia did not shy away from adding the gory detail of blood spurting so profusely as to stain Judith's breast. The naturalistic virility of the work provoked strong reactions on its arrival in Florence, and the painting was denied the honor of being exhibited in the gallery. In fact, it was only with great difficulty and with the help of her friend Galileo that the painter managed to extract the payment with a significant delay that had been agreed with Grand Duke Cosimo II de Medici, who died in 1621, shortly after the great canvas was completed. Today, this painting also represents the human and professional tale of a woman who chose to be an artist in an era dominated by men. Judith is thought to be a self-portrait. Holofernes is thought to be a portrait of Agostino Tassi, the mentor her father hired to teach Artemisia because women were not allowed to attend the art academy. Tragically, she was raped by Tassi while under his tutelage, hence the inspiration for the painting. Medusa by Caravaggio has been in the Uffizi since 1631 and was restored in 2002. 
According to Greek mythology, Medusa, with her head of snakes, would transform anyone who looked directly at her into stone. It was commissioned as a ceremonial shield and was painted in Rome as a gift to one of the Medici. The purpose of the commission was to symbolize the Grand Duke of Tuscany's courage in defeating his enemies. Although Caravaggio depicts Medusa's severed head, she remains conscious. Her wide open mouth exhibits a silent but dramatic scream and her shocked eyes show a sense of disbelief as she thought she was invincible. Well that's the end of the Uffizi Gallery tour. I hope it was informative and if you're in Florence it's definitely worth a visit. Thanks for watching. From the outside, the Palazzo Vecchio, meaning Old Palace, looks like a defensive fortress, but on the inside, you will find beautifully decorated halls, apartments, and chapels. Construction on the Palazzo Vecchio was from 1299 to 1304, erected by Anafo di Cambio above the ruins of destroyed towers. The entire construction also rests on top of the ancient theater of the Roman colony of Florentia dating back to the 1st century AD, whose ruins can be seen later in the video. From the very beginning, the main section of the Palazzo Vecchio was destined to host the city council, which was composed of chief members of the guilds of Florence, the Priory, who governed the Republic of Florence. In 1342, the Duke of Athens enlarged what was then called the Palazzo della Signoria, giving it the appearance of a fortress and even adding a secret staircase for nightly exits. It was enlarged by Giorgio Vasari in the 16th century and by Bernardo Bontalenti in the 17th century. It was also used as a royal residence by the powerful Medici family, but today it is still used as a city hall. We start in the Hall of 500, known in Italian as the Salone di Cinquecento. I first saw the Hall of 500 in the movie Inferno with Tom Hanks, the third movie in the Da Vinci Code trilogy. Let me start with the coolest and most fascinating fact about the Hall of 500. The two titans of the Renaissance, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, both worked in this room at the same time in a competition. That's like having the Beatles and Rolling Stones each recording different songs at the same time in the same recording studio. Both artists were commissioned to each paint a battle scene mural on the wall, but neither painting remains today. Before we get more information about their competition, here's some brief history about the Hall of 500. It is the largest room in Italy made for a civil power palace and was built in 1494, commissioned by Dominican friar Giolomo Savonarola. Savonarola had ousted the Medici from power for a short period and had founded a new Florentine Republic, which lasted between 1494 and 1498. He tried to establish a more democratic government for the city of Florence and thus created the Council of 500 or Great Council, consisting of 500 people, modeled after the Grand Council of Venice. In this way, the decision-making power belonged to a greater number of citizens and it was more difficult for a single person to take control of the city. The tangible result of these reforms was the creation of the Salone dei Cinquecento in the government building, which at the time involved a remarkable engineering effort. According to the austerity pursued by Savonarola, the room was also very basic and almost devoid of decoration. Savonarola was arrested in 1498, hanged, and burned at the stake in the nearby Piazza della Signoria as a heretic and for preaching new things. Management of power was given to Piero Sudarini, who was appointed Gonfalonieri for life, which meant he was holder of a highly prestigious communal office. He decided to decorate the Salone dei Cinquecento and succeeded in reaching an agreement with the two greatest Florentine artists of the time, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, for the construction of two large murals to decorate the walls of the room with battles celebrating the victories of the Republic. Leonardo started working on the Battle of Anguirare in 1503, which celebrated a famous Florentine victory, while Michelangelo focused on another portion of the wall for the Battle of Cascina. The two geniuses of the Renaissance would have an opportunity to work for a certain period of time face to face in direct competition with each other, but as I mentioned, none of their work was ever completed. Leonardo was in his early 50s and had just painted the Mona Lisa. Michelangelo was 29 at the time. This was a contest and Michelangelo made his dislike for da Vinci so clear that da Vinci eventually went to France to get away from Michelangelo. Da Vinci was always trying new methods and materials and decided to mix wax into his pigments. Da Vinci had finished painting part of the wall, but it was not drying fast enough, 
so he brought in containers with hot coals to try to hurry the process. As others watched in horror, the wax and the fresco melted under the intense heat and the colors ran down the walls to form a puddle on the floor. It was painted over in 1565. Michelangelo never proceeded beyond the preparatory drawings for the fresco he was commissioned to paint on the opposite wall. Pope Julius II called him to Rome to paint the Sistine Chapel, and Michelangelo's sketches were destroyed by eager young artists who came to study them and took away parts of the sketches. Later the Medici returned to power, and in 1540 chose Palazzo Vecchio as a residence, radically transforming it. Most of the work was entrusted to Giorgio Vasari who enlarged the hall. The Salone di Cinquecento was transformed from a place of celebration of the power of the Republic to the boardroom of the Duke Cosimo I de Medici, where he received ambassadors and gave audience to the people. The surviving decorations in this hall were made between 1555 and 1572 by Giorgio Vasari and his helpers. They mark the culmination of mannerism and make this hall the showpiece of the palace. These large frescoes depict battles and military victories by Florence over Pisa and Siena. In the battle at the Tower of San Vincenzo, the Florentine troops attacked the Pisan army in 1505 near the Tower of San Vincenzo. The outcome was uncertain until the Florentines deployed a battery of six small cannons and attacked the enemy from several sides. Maximilian of Austria attempts the Siege of Leghorn. In 1496, the Habsburg Emperor Maximilian I came to the Pisans' aid along with other Italian states and attacked the Florentine stronghold near Leghorn. The attack not only failed, but a storm shipwrecked the imperial fleet and forced the troops to withdraw. The Storming of the Fortress of Stampes In 1499, the Florentines captured the stronghold of Stampes in Pisa. The fresco is full of detail because the artist Naldini was sent there to observe the battle. Capture of the fort near the port of Camolia. In 1554, the Florentine army attacked one of the Sienese forts near the port of Camolia, surprising the guards in their sleep. This marked the beginning of the war with Siena. The capture of Porto Ercoli. After the capture of Siena, numerous Sienese, Frenchmen, and political exiles took refuge near Porto Ecoli. After a 24-day siege, they were forced to surrender to the Florentine troops. The Battle of Marciano and Val di Chiana was a decisive victory over Siena in 1554. The army of Florentine exiles who opposed the Medici, along with Frenchmen, attacked the Medici and imperial troops but were routed by the enemy. The ornate ceiling consists of 39 panels constructed and painted by Vasari and his assistants, representing great episodes from the life of Cosimo I, the quarters of the city, and the city itself. Towards the center was the apotheosis of Cosimo I. Duke Cosimo I of Medici, wearing a purple mantle, is seated among the clouds and is accompanied by the ducal crown, the cross of the Order of St. Stephen, and the Golden Fleece. He is encircled by the coats of arms of the city and the insignias of the Florentine guilds. On the north side of the hall is the stage called the Tribuna del Udienza, built by Bartolomeo Bandinelli for Cosimo I as a place to receive citizens and ambassadors. The architecture was inspired by a Roman triumphal arch to enhance the power of the leader and host a number of niches containing statues of members of the Medici family. The two largest arches contain the statues of the two Medici popes, Leo X, and Clement VII, who is shown crowning Charles V, King of Spain. 
The other niches contain additional members of the Medici family, and the boxes above their main enterprises are depicted. This is Michelangelo's The Genius of Victory, which was originally intended for the tomb of Julius II. The statue was placed in this hall by Vasari. In 1868, it was removed to the Bargello Museum, but was returned by officials in 1921. At the end of the hall is a small side room without windows. The studiolo of Francesco I de' Medici was a small secret study designed by Vasari from 1570 to 1575. It was built as an annex to the adjoining ducal apartments, which became the residence of Prince Francesco. It once contained jewels, metals, carved stones, cut crystals, vases, and cabinets. The walls in the barrel vault are filled with paintings, stucco, and sculptures. Most paintings are by the school of Vasari and represent the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air. The portrait of Cosimo I and his wife, Eleonora di Toledo, was painted by Bronzino. You can see more of Bronzino's work in the Uffizi Gallery. From a peephole, Francesco spied on his ministers and officers during meetings in the Hall of 500. Dismantled within decades of its construction, it was reassembled in the 20th century. I see naked people. All right, we are going up the tower at Palazzo Vecchio. This one's only 246 steps. Well, here it says 223 steep steps. Let's find out. <laughs> here are the stone stairs. Okay. Okay. Oh boy. One step at a time. Okay. Uh, I did see a defibrillator downstairs. May need it. This is a third big climb. We did the climb up the dome the other day. The dome the other day. That was, step, that was 436 steps. We did that. Yesterday we climbed to the top of the Tower of Pisa. I think that was 296 steps. This is only 246 steps and they said 223 are steep. Yes they are. But we will get there. And we won't be climbing any towers for a while, but you cannot beat the views once you're at the top, as you will see in a few minutes. Is this the top? Yes. Yes. We made it. Incredible views, though. Well, that's the Arno River. That is uh, Santa Croce, where Michelangelo and Galileo are buried, and where I may be buried very soon if my heart doesn't slow down. But the best view is coming up. At, up. Wow, and here it is. That is the Duomo, the Florence Cathedral. On the right is a Brunelleschi dome. Uh, Giotto's tower, bell tower. Beautiful building. And the front of that cathedral is amazing. All right. Don't worry, only 700 more steps. This makes me very dizzy. Hey, stop picking your nose. That's it. Thank you.
The second floor of the Palazzo Vecchio was the more private section of the palace, featuring elegant apartments, small chambers, and a chapel. These are the apartments of Leo X, also known as Giovanni de' Medici, which consist of six rooms, decorated by Vasari and his assistants since 1560 with frescoes which celebrate the Medici family. Their construction was ordered by Duke Cosimo I de' Medici to extend the palace. This first room is dedicated to Cosimo the Elder, to whom the Medici family was indebted for securing the family's prestige in the 15th century. This is the room of Lorenzo the Magnificent, grandson of Cosimo the Elder. In this scene, he is shown receiving tributes from Italian and foreign ambassadors with many exotic gifts. In this room of Leo X, Leo X visits Florence for the first time since he became Pope as he enters the Piazza Signoria. The apartments of the elements are made up of five rooms built by Battista del Tasso in 1550 and decorated by Vasari and his assistants between 1556 and 1566. The room of the elements is dedicated to the allegories of the ancient elements of earth, air, fire, and water. This is the Jupiter room. Here we see Jupiter raised by nymphs and suckled by the goat Amalfia. In the Hall of Hercules, we see this writing cabinet made of ebony inlaid with semi-precious stones. These are the apartments of Eleonora di Toledo. The chapel of Eleanor is decorated with frescoes by Bronzino. This is the deposition of Christ. The ceiling is decorated with frescoes of the apocalypse. The room of the Sabines was frequented by ladies of the court and contains portraits of members of the Medici family. The room of Esther is the dining room. The room of Penelope features frescoes in the style of Botticelli. The audience hall was built by Benedetto da Maiano from 1475 to 1481. His brother Giuliano also produced the ornate coffered pure gold ceiling. The Hall of the Lilies was also built by Benedetto, 
while the gilded wood ceiling is the work once again of his brother Giuliano. This is a painting of St. Zenobius, bishop and protector of Florence. This is the Hall of Maps, the original Guadaroba, where the most relevant documents were kept together with the Mappa Mundi, a six-foot-tall sphere which had been the largest rotating globe of its era, and dozens of geographic maps painted on leather, showing the world as it was known in 1563. This is the courtyard by Michelozzo di Bartolomeo Michelozzi. In 1470, Michelozzo gave a Renaissance look to the courtyard, but the decoration of the columns with gold stuccos, the vault of the portico with grotesque figures, and the walls painted with views of Austrian cities are the work of Vasari, who created these for the marriage of Francesco I of Medici with Joanna of Austria. The archaeological excavations in the basement of the palace have brought to light important and suggestive evidence of the past. Where now stands the Palazzo Vecchio, there was once the ancient Roman theater of Florentia from the first century AD. It was a relatively big theater, capable of seating eight to 10,000 spectators. The theater remained active until the fifth century. Then following the crisis of the Roman Empire, it gradually fell into disuse and decay, subject to damage and looting. This underground section of the Palazzo Vecchio was opened in October 2014. Well, that's the end of the Palazzo Vecchio tour. I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. When people think of the Galleria dell'Accademia, they think of the magnificent statue of David, but there's a lot more to the museum than the statue. Before we see David, let's take a look at the first room you enter, the Hall of the Colossus, which is one of the opening acts for the star attraction. The room acquired its name during the 19th century when it housed the plaster cast model of a large ancient statue of the twins Castor and Pollux, which is no longer displayed in the gallery. It now hosts the plaster model for the marble sculpture of John Bologna's Rape of the Sabine Women. John Bologna, a Flemish sculptor inspired by Michelangelo, created for the first time a tightly knit group of three figures carved just from one block of marble, which offers multiple viewpoints to the observer. The cast depicts three figures connected by a serpentine-shaped movement, with one man lifting a woman into the air while a second man crouches. The name of the Rape of the Sabine Women was suggested by his contemporary, Vincenzo Borghini. The sculpture suggests that one man had abducted the woman and the husband looks on in horror. The Rape of the Sabine Women was an incident in Roman mythology in which the men of Rome committed a mass abduction of young women from the other cities in the region. Modern scholars tend to interpret the word as abduction or kidnapping as opposed to a sexual assault. Giambologna's ability to sculpt bodies in the old classical style with figures of naked women in seductive poses increased his fame at the end of the 16th century. The left wing of the Hall of the Colossus exhibits six examples of 15th century altarpieces shown in chronological order to show the development of the Florentine school. Starting on the left with a square panel by Andrea de Gusto from 1437, it ends with Domenico Ghirlandaio's artwork on the far right. 
Here we see three large altarpieces. The largest panel in the middle is by Pietro Perugino, which was commissioned by the monks of the Abbey in Vallombrosa in 1500 for the high altar of the church. The main subject is the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, surrounded by singing and playing angels, featuring various musical instruments and colorful draperies. Down below the main scene, Perugino painted four saints connected to the devotion of the Camaldolese monks. Among them on the extreme right is St. Michael the Archangel, dressed up in glittering armor. To the left of the Assumption is Filippino Lippi's deposition from the cross. It shows the moment in which Jesus Christ is taken down from the cross after his death. The panel was begun in 1504 by Filippino Lippi and after his death was completed by Perugino who was responsible for the entire lower part of the painting until 1507. The two levels are stylistically very different and thus create a separation. The upper part features Filippino's typical search for motion and movement, a large number of characters moving about the cross in equilibrium and fluttering ribbons. Raffaellino del Garbo's resurrection was originally painted for a church in a monastery in Monte Alavetto in Florence. He was a pupil of Filippino Lippi. The main work on this wall is the front panel of a wedding chest called the Cassoni Adamare, belonging to the Adamare family, depicting a typical Florentine Renaissance wedding feast and portraying medieval streets, monuments, and precious costumes, witnessing the customs and wealth of the noble families in the early to mid 15th century. Before you get close to Michelangelo's David, you will see many other works by the master, including the group of four unfinished marble statues of slaves in this, the Hall of the Prisoners. They were created in the 1520s and 1530s as part of a monumental tomb for Pope Julius II, which was later scaled down in size. The statues seem to try and escape from the marble block. It is now claimed that Michelangelo deliberately left them incomplete to represent this eternal struggle of human beings trying to free themselves from their material trappings. The young slave seems almost bound within himself, burying his face in his left arm and hiding the right one around the hips. The study of human anatomy is highlighted in the left elbow and the careful lines of the bent biceps and triceps. His face, which is just beginning to emerge, seems so youthful by comparison with his muscular nature. The Awakening Slave is one of the most powerful and expressive works among the slaves. It is the least outlined of the four prisoners. The figure feels like it is trying to explode out of the marble block that holds it. Michelangelo is famous for saying that he worked to liberate the forms imprisoned in the marble. He saw his job as simply removing what was extraneous. This endless struggle of man to free himself from his physical constraints is a metaphor of the flesh burdening the soul. The third statue is the bearded slave, the most finished of the four slaves. The figure is almost free, only his hands and part of his arm, probably planned to hold a cloth, are unfinished. The face is covered by a thick curly beard, and the thighs are bound by straps of cloth. The torso is finely modeled, revealing Michelangelo's deep knowledge of anatomy. The fourth sculpture is the Atlas slave, although we don't get a great look at it here. The male nude seems to be carrying a huge weight on his head. Hence he is named after Atlas, the titan who held up the entire world on his shoulders. The Palestrina Pieta is a marble sculpture from the Italian High Renaissance dating from around 1555. It was formerly attributed to Michelangelo, but now it is considered mostly to have been completed by someone else, such as Niccolo Mangini or John Lorenzo Bernini. The Pieta depicts three figures, one of them the body of Jesus Christ. The sculpture was originally in a room besides the Santa Rosalia Church in Palestrina and was owned by the Barberini family. The most important masterpiece in the Galleria dell'Accademia is Michelangelo's statue of David, possibly the world's most famous statue, which is housed in the Tribune. The 17-foot-tall statue was commissioned by the Florentine Republic, who saw the biblical hero slaying the giant Goliath as a symbol for the creation of the new and growing republic. Because of the nature of the hero it represented, the statue soon came to symbolize the defense of civil liberties embodied in the Republic of Florence, an independent city-state threatened on all sides by more powerful rival states and in some respects by the powerful Medici family.
the eyes of David, with a warning glare, were turned towards Rome. David was originally commissioned as one of a series of statues of prophets to be positioned along the roofline of the Florence Cathedral, but was instead placed in the Piazza della Signoria, where it was unveiled in September 1504. The statue was moved to the Galleria dell'Accademia in 1873 to protect it from the elements, and was later replaced at the original location by a replica. Another replica can be found at the center of the Piazzale Michelangelo. The statue, which was created by Michelangelo from 1501 to 1504 from a single block of marble, was instantly admired for its proportions and attention to detail, and brought instant fame to the 29-year-old Michelangelo, who chose to depict David as an adolescent instead of a young boy, as was customary. The statue appears to show David after he has made the decision to fight Goliath, but before the battle has actually taken place. The statue is a Renaissance interpretation of a common ancient Greek theme of the standing heroic male nude. Italian painter, architect, and writer Giorgio Vasari had this to say about the statue. Quote, When all was finished, it cannot be denied that this work is carried off the palm from all other statues, modern or ancient, Greek or Latin. No other artwork is equal to it in any respect. With such just proportion, beauty, and excellence did Michelangelo finish it. End quote. In April 1527, after the expulsion of the Medici from Florence, Republicans entrenched in the Palazzo Vecchio were trying to dismiss the Medici supporters who pushed at the door. They threw stones and tiles from the windows, and a bench struck the left arm of David, breaking it into three pieces, recovered by a young Vasari after being abandoned for three days. This probably produced a split of the slingshot, clearly visible behind his back, the loss of some tips of curls, and a small rupture along the lower lid of the right eye. During World War II, David was entombed in brick to protect it from damage from airborne bombs. In 1991, the foot of the statue was damaged by a man with a hammer. It was then found that the marble that Michelangelo used contained many microscopic holes that caused it to deteriorate faster than other marble. Because of the marble's degradation, from 2003 to 2004, the statue was given its first major cleaning since 1843. The Museum of Musical Instruments hosts a collection of about 50 musical instruments. The works reveal that music played a primary role in everyday life and official celebrations of the Medici court. The musicians hired by the Medicis and their instruments at the court of Grand Prince Fernando were portrayed by Anton Domenico Gabbiani in a cycle of canvases painted from 1685 to 1690. It's like uh, a harp, and it is in marble because it was a gift for the Prince Ferdinand of the Medici family. You see him there, very elegant, dressed in green, with the musicians, with the um, singers. He often invited, among them, the castrati, the castrated singers. The fourth from the right side is a castrated singer. You can tell it from the effeminate face. One of the most important works exhibited here is the one-of-a-kind tenor viola made by Antonio Stradivari in 1690. The viola is built in red spruce and maple wood, decorated with the Medici crest and mother of pearl, ivory, and ebony inlays. The tenor viola was part of the five instruments used in the Medici Quintet, a unique group of five-string instruments built exclusively for the Grand Prince Fernando in 1690. The viola is a masterpiece, the only one entirely conserved in its original form.
This is the harpsichord, original, 690, by Bartolomeo Cristofori, considered to be as the father of modern piano. That's a copy. Original uh, upright piano, so-called, uh, by a pupil of Bartolomeo Cristofori called Del Melo. We have a, on the extreme left side, uh, an original English uh, uh, harpsichord from the 18th century. And you know that the mechanism of a piano is like a little hammer. These next few rooms are dedicated to Florentine Gothic painting, featuring go-back altarpieces coming from the most important Florentine churches and convents. They have a dream. They have Byzantine faces. They are so different from the faces you have seen, you have seen the lab. Because they were painted in the 1250s under a strong Byzantine influence. Byzantine, so it's that in all Nowadays, it's not the third. But that was the capital of the Eastern Empire. It is the tree born from the wood of the cross where Jesus Christ was crucified. And then we have the birth of the 12 branches corresponding to the 12 apostles. The largest panel exhibited in the hall is a tree-shaped cross by Pacino di Buonaguita, symbolizing the tree of life. The painting was originally housed in a Florence convent. According to the Apocalypse, this tree represents salvation and offers gifts to humankind depicted as fruits alongside the twelve branches. The scenes in the roundels hanging from these branches represent episodes of Christ's life, his passion, and glory. The tree is rooted in the Garden of Eden at the very bottom, where scenes from Genesis about creation and Adam and Eve's life play out. The four figures seated or kneeling at the base of the cross are from left to right, Moses, St. Francis, St. Clair, and St. John the Evangelist. Up above in the cusp is the celestial court of heaven, with enthroned Christ and the Virgin Mary, surrounded by angels, saints, and prophets. Between heaven and the cross is a pelican piercing its breast to feed its young with blood. It represents a symbol of Christ's sacrifice on the cross for the salvation of mankind. The Arcania Room features the Pentecost by Andrea Di Cione, showing the moment in which the Holy Spirit, symbolized by a white dove on the top, appears as tongues of fire and descends upon the Apostles and the Virgin Mary. The painter depicts a large standing Madonna that dominates the central stage of the composition, surrounded by six kneeling Apostles and two angels in flight who are witnessing the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Three Apostles are set in each of the lateral panels. In particular, one of them looks outward, involving the viewer in the sacred event. Another artwork of note in the room is the large go-back piece featuring an imposing godfather enthroned behind the crucified Christ and with the white dove which symbolizes the Holy Spirit. The depiction of Trinity is inserted within the central panel surrounded by two saints, St. Romuald and St. John the Baptist. The panel was painted in 1365 by Nardo de Cioni for the chapter house of the Monastery of St. Mary of the Angels in Florence dedicated to St. Romuald. The saint was the founder of the Camaldolisi Order. The main central cusp shows the symbol of human salvation, the Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God. The most important and famous panel painting in the hall is the Coronation of the Virgin, which was done in the 1370s and was restored in 2011. It was created by Jacobo de Cione with help from two other artists. The panel was known in Florence as the altarpiece of the Mint and was commissioned by the magistrates of the Mint, which helps explain why the panel features a massive amount of gold. It represents the coronation of the Virgin, surrounded by ten saints and two prophets. Hi, this is Andy Teach, host of Andy's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to Florence, Italy.
The Basilica of Santa Croce, Church of the Holy Cross, was built in the late 13th century in the Florentine Gothic style. The church is known as the Pantheon of Florence since it contains the tombs of many famous Italians. Construction of the church started in 1295 on a site near the Arno River where Franciscan friars had built a small oratory. According to Italian architect Giorgio Vasari, the church was designed by Arnolfo di Cambio, a Florentine sculptor and architect. The church was consecrated in 1443 by Pope Eugene IV. The marble facade by Jewish-Italian architect Nicola Matas was added even later between 1853 and 1863. He is buried under the entry to the basilica. Funds for its construction were provided by a wealthy British citizen. From across the Arno River, you can see how large the church truly is. The white facade is on the left. In 1512, the bell tower was destroyed by lightning and it was only replaced in 1847 by a new neo-Gothic tower. Famous Italian writers, composers, poets, and politicians are buried here, but the most famous monument inside Santa Croce is the one that contains the remains of Michelangelo de Lodovico Buonarroti Simoni, better known as Michelangelo or Michelangelo. It was designed by Giorgio Vasari and shows Michelangelo's bust flanked by the mourning allegorical figures of painting, architecture, and sculpture. Michelangelo died in 1564 in Rome, where a tomb was built for the artist in the Church of the Twelve Holy Apostles. Michelangelo, however, had indicated he wanted to be buried in his native hometown, so with the approval of the Duke of Florence, his nephew stole the artist's body and transported it to Florence. Opposite Michelangelo's tomb sits the tomb of Galileo Galilei, the father of modern physics. Galileo died in 1642, but as a result of his condemnation by the church in 1633, he wasn't allowed a Christian burial until 1737 when his body was buried here. The central bust of Galileo is gazing toward the stars. The allegorical statue on the left represents astronomy, while the statue on the right represents geometry. There are several more monuments in the church, including the tomb of Niccolo Machiavelli, an historian and diplomat whose book The Prince led to the term Machiavellianism. Aside from the basilica, several important palazzos are on the square. On the south side of the square lies the Palazzo dell'Antella, a long building with a facade decorated with beautiful but mostly destroyed 17th century frescoes containing a theme of virtue and divinity. The facade is the design of architect Giulio Perigi and is the result of the union of two previously existing houses and was commissioned by the owner of the building, Niccolo dell'Antella, a lieutenant of the Academy of Drawing, and made in the years 1619 and 1620. Many artists worked on this decoration under the direction of Giovanni da San Giovanni. The windows are made of odd sizes. The building has the windows positioned at greater distances gradually away from the basilica. The windows closest to the church are nearer to each other. This is to give an illusion of greater depth and therefore makes the square look bigger. From the church, the windows all appear to be the same size. Palazzo Cocchi Serristori is on the opposite end of the basilica. Today it houses the headquarters of the first quarter neighborhood of Florence. So I found Il Porcelino in the New Market. Il Porcelino means little pig or piglet, but actually Il Porcelino is a boar, just like me. Now for good luck, what you do is you place a coin in the mouth and if it drops into the grate, you will have good luck. So that's what I'm gonna do. Bad luck. <laughs> So I'm going to try it again because I want some good luck. Okay. <laughs> 
You need to put the coins in. Bad luck. I'm going to try one more time. Three times is the charm, I hope. Yes. Good luck, finally. 